Hello, AP Biology students interested in my review today. All right. So this is a review for Unit 2, Cell Organelles and Cell Transport. So I'm going to go to another screen where I'm going to be able to draw and write with you um, and create kind of a little. We're going to start by comparing and contrasting prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I thought that would be a good place to start. So here we go. Okay, now you should be able to see that. Now again, if you have questions to um, make contributions, you're going to have to turn your mic on and share that way because I can't see your chats. Um, so let me just uh, let me just ask the question: Would I put what would I put that prokaryotes and eukaryotes both have? Can you throw out some things that I could put in the both section? A nucleus? Yeah. Oh, no. No. DNA. Nucleus goes, DNA, definitely. Nucleus goes over here. But a prokaryote does not have a nucleus. They both have DNA. Membrane. Right? And a cell membrane. Yes, they both have a cell membrane. Good. Ribosome. has Ribosomes goes in both. Excellent. Yes. Very good. Mitochondria. Right. Mitochondria is actually a membrane bound organelle. So that would go over here. Cytoplasm. That is present in both, although I'm going to call it cytosol instead of cytoplasm. Because the fluid in the cell exists in both. But technically, cytoplasm includes membrane-bound organelles. They both have. They both have all of these. That's good. Um, what can we say about? Um, let's add some more to the eukaryote side. What else can we put in there that the prokaryotes don't have? Cell wall. Ah, prokaryotes have those too. They both have cell walls. Even though plant cells are eukaryotes, animal cells don't, right? But eukaryotes are very capable of having cell walls, and all prokaryotes have cell walls. That's a good thing to know. I'm glad we wrote, I'm glad we, somebody said that. They both have DNA, right? Is the DNA in, in the same uh, kind of organization in both? Like in a prokaryote, what does the DNA look like? Does, is it in a chromosome form? Because in a eukaryote, a eukaryote has linear chromosomes, right? A eukaryote has chromosomes that actually look like that. Prokaryotes have circular. Circular. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <sighs> Let's see if I can. Yeah, there we go, that's better. Back to black. A prokaryote has a circular, a single circular chromosome. That's an important difference. They both have DNA, but they're still um organized again i can't see your chats or i know you're raising your hands but all you need to do is is just shout it out what else can we put with eukaryotes and we know eukaryotes have a long list of things inside of them right they've got a nucleus they've got mitochondria they've got linear chromosomes inside the nucleus Something else inside the nucleus you might be forgetting. A little circular shadow. Nucleolus. Nucleolus, very good. Nucleolus. Remember what it does? Makes. Uh... Yes. Make something. 
chromatin or chromosomes? Not exactly. No, the chromatin and chromosomes don't really get made by anything. They're just sort of there. The nucleus makes ribosomes. Let's say ribosome factory. Since we're here, let's go back up here. The nucleus, you know, is the control center, right? And it's the site of transcription and the place where DNA is stored. The mitochondria, do you know what that does? Produces energy. Yes, energy in the form of what? What molecules come from? ATP. ATP, yes. Okay, so the mitochondria makes makes ATP, and it's a little bit more complicated than that, but we're not there yet. But yes, mitochondria makes ATP, which is the form of cellular energy, and it breaks down glucose to do it. Linear chromosomes, I'm right in here that they store genetic information, right? You know that. They store genetic info. That's where all the DNA and the genes are. Make your, make your all right. Um, what other membrane-bound organelles we just got through talking about in the endomembrane system? which is only in eukaryotes. What are those? ERs? Yes. Okay, and there's two types, right? So the ER the and the rough. The rough and then the smooth. Right. Okay, and let's talk about the functions of those because those, those do get important, right? So the rough are rough because there are ribosomes on the surface. So the rough ER is really responsible for um, um, producing and packaging and transporting protein. Read my handwriting. So the rough ER is proteins. It's all about proteins. The smooth ER is, there's two things. One was detoxifying, detoxifying uh, molecules in the cell um, that come along and need to be detoxified. And also lipid synthesis. And that includes phospholipids and some other things too, like steroids and other things. Synthesis. Smooth ER is all about those things. The rough ER is producing and transporting proteins because the ribosomes are. But that's good. Okay. There's not much in prokaryotes, is there? <laughs> prokaryotes is a cell membrane with ribosomes and cytosol. They do have cell walls and they have DNA. So they're able to make their own proteins and um, and and they do uh, they do a form of glycolysis make their ATP because they don't have mitochondria. But more than that, there isn't a whole lot else there. Other things that they can both have, though, and you may not have thought of this, but some of them, uh, and again, not all of them have it, but they have things like flagella and cilia, some of them. Flagella. Is it appropriate to say that only eukaryotes can like, reproduce themselves and prokaryotes? said uh, produced by binary fusion. Yes, yes, that is appropriate to say that. I'm just going to add, finish this since I started it. So cilia and there's things like that on them. So I will add that. It's really good. Binary fusion is unique to prokaryotes. And it's just, it's, it's bacteria, right? Because they're all bacteria. Bacteria divide. It's the way they divide. And because their chromosome is a circular chromosome, we, we don't call that mitosis because mitosis is a very specific division of linear chromosomes. So I'll put over here, um, these guys divide by mitosis, which is very specific to these linear chromosomes I was drawing up here. A prokaryote, Right, a little tiny bacteria has a circular, long, one single circular chromosome in it. So binary fission of this prokaryote looks very different from the mitosis of a cell that has a bunch of 
chromosomes in it that each need to line up and be properly separated. So my is over here, binary fission over here. That's a difference. Okay. Um, pull this down a little bit. Okay, eukaryotes. Eukaryotes also have some more things that we haven't listed yet, and we assume doing it, it's a really good thing to add the functions because I know people were um, concerned about that. So we have rough and smooth ER. Remember, there's a Golgi body here too, right? Which bacteria definitely don't have. Golgi apparatus, I think is what your likes to call it. And the Golgi apparatus, we just learned what it does. What is it? What does that do? The Golgi apparatus. Packs protein. Yeah, it's a packager, yes. And not just proteins. It, remember, it also took uh, lipids from the smoothie yard and packaged those, too. So it is a packaging um, organelle. They kind of called it the post office right, or the UPS building. Packaging of um, lipids proteins proteins right okay and once they're packaged what are they inside because that's another membrane bound organelle v vesicles yeah it's vesicles and there's lots of there's lots of different types of vesicles right some vesicles might become lysosomes if they have digestive enzymes in them, and lysosomes are kind of the digesting machines of animal cells, right? Or some vesicles might become secretory, secretory vesicles that might um, bump up against the membrane and secrete um, products into the bloodstream. Or there's other types as well. There's other types. Or there are other types that you might not really necessarily need to know. But those vesicles that are coming either from the ER and bumping into the Golgi or from the Golgi and bumping into the cell membrane um, are usually these small little vesicles and they're filled with various things depending on what kind of cell you're in and what needs to be secreted or done. Okay, there's another, another really, really important uh, one that plant cells have. Plant cells have what? Chloroplast. Yes, chloroplasts. Remember, that's definitely part of the endosymbiotic theory, and they do photosynthesis. And um, plant cells also have um, that's a good way of organizing this. I'm just going to say it. They have very large central vacuoles and that's important for this unit because you learned all about water potential and turgidity right mm -hmm. and those large central vacuoles are all about um structure they contain water and need to be Need to have turgidity, particularly when we're talking about land plants. And that's where water potential comes into play. That can, that's a, there's a connection there. Okay, so um, other than that, I'm going to come back up here and kind of insert the word vacuole. Into the cell organelle areas. Remember that animal plants have vacuoles. Oh, sorry, animal cells. I'm very tired, guys. Excuse me. Animal cells, very small vacuoles. And they do store a bit of water. And they have a very different, um, very different purpose than the plant cells. So plant cells have these guys and they're and they're vacuoles that what with water in them are very large animal cells vacuoles are not for support or structures they're just for storing water and maybe some salts and other things 
They don't have the structural um, purpose that the plant cell central vacuoles have. Okay. Um, you know, they're probably, oh, we never, we never actually, actually said what ribosomes do. What do ribosomes do, guys? Let's go back here. The job of a ribosome, you really do need to support they make protein. Yes, make protein. Good. Okay. So remember, the ribosomes make protein. And what's the organelle that makes the ribosomes in a eukaryotic cell? Nucleolus. Nucleolus. Is this the Ralph Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. OK, all right. So the nucleolus makes the ribosomes, and then the ribosomes leave the nucleus and go out into the cytosol uh, in a eukaryotic cell and make proteins. Here's a good thing that you might see on the list. Um, let me draw this because it'll be easier if I draw it. What if you have, you have a eukaryotic cell here, OK, and you have that nucleus. And you have you have rough ER here, right? And you know that there's ribosomes on the rough ER. But there's also ribosomes that you'll find out here in the cytosol, just floating free. So the ribosomes that are on the ER are making proteins. You know, what is the fate of the proteins that are made by these ribosomes? Generally, where are they going to wind up? They're either going to go two places. They're going to be secreted, right, in a little vesicle that contains them, or they're going to stay in the cell in a vesicle and then become a lysosome or become a peroxisome or something that it's in a vesicle that's been packaged by the Golgi body, right? So the ER, the rough ER ribosomes are making proteins that are very often being made for secretion or being made to do a job inside a vesicle. These free guys out here, they're making proteins too. But what's the fate of those proteins? They are going to be proteins that are going to be needed free in the cytosol, right? For whatever metabolic purpose is needed. So it's a little bit different from the, e, the rough ER ribosomes. These ribosomes here, ribosomes are so small that we almost draw them as if they were like molecules, even though they're not, right? These are cytosolic ribosomes. And these are rough ER ribosomes. And the proteins that they make, right, we already said, they're going to be for secretion or they're going to stay within a vesicle and do work inside a vesicle. Cytosolic ribosomes are making proteins for use in the cytosol. For example, these proteins might be enzymes used in glycolysis. If you remember, glycolysis happens right there, free in the cytoplasm, floating around, right? And you need enzymes in order for glycolysis to work. And enzymes are made of protein. So, for example, proteins that would come from cytosolic ribosomes would just be floating free in the cytosol and might join in to help break down glucose into pyruvic acid, which is what glycolysis does. Okay, there, that was a teachable moment. Okay, that's a pretty good synopsis of, you know, I had some, some other plans here to take you into other things. Can we move on to other things? Yes. Excellent, okay, let's take a free page here, all right. So now, uh, let's talk about, do you remember um, the concept of surface area to volume? 
you did that such a long time ago, and I just want to make sure that you remember what that means. Remember Mr. W's video? So let me give you an example. What if you had a cell that was small and had a surface area um, of six centi oops, centimeters squared versus a volume of one centimeter cube. Okay. And then I have another cell that's much larger and it has a surface area of, let's say, 10 centimeters squared with a volume of 8 cubic. Okay, which one has the largest surface area to volume? L1. That's right. Okay, so the ratio for cell one is actually six to one, isn't it? Uh, the ratio for cell two is actually five to four. Right. <laughs> okay, so this is a larger ratio, isn't it? Larger ratio. This is smaller. Even though the cell is bigger, surface area to ratio is smaller okay which which cell um is a happier healthier cell a one yes okay so this is your happy cell okay and the reason is because this cell the little cell has more surface area more cell membrane more cell membrane to bring in more food and remove waste compared to its small volume, right? So it's got a greater amount of cell members servicing that small little volume versus this one where not as much cell membrane to service, right, to bring in enough food, that large, hungry cytoplasm. Yes? Okay. So this is why, um, uh, the, the cell size, cell size and surface area to volume ratios are indirectly proportional, right? And the cells are small. May you please, like, tell me what's after large? Large, hungry cytoplasm. Yeah. Thank you. Large, hungry cytoplasm. Sorry about that. Okay. So the larger a cell is, the more difficult it is time it has um, getting in enough food and putting on enough waste to to keep its cytoplasm healthy. Um, okay, so surface area to volume ratios. Um, all right. Here we go. All right, so that's good. How about Hmm. about some diffusion osmosis problems, right? Just practice osmosis and diffusion. Here's a good one. What if we have a U-shaped tube? Hopefully you've tried these problems on that worksheet on your own. This is a good example that I just found. Whenever you have a U-shaped tube problem, you want to pay very close attention to the permeability powers of the membrane there. So in this case, I'm going to say glucose and water move and move through that membrane 
starch cannot. Okay, so that's the permeability of the membrane. I'm giving you that information. So now let's give you a problem here. Let's say we've got over here 0.8 molar starch and 1.0 glucose. 0.8 starch, 0 0.8 starch, 1.0 molar sucrose. Over here, 0 0.2 starch and 0 0.5 glucose. All right. So first, tell me what things are going to move. I think that glucose from the tube A will move to B. Yes. Okay. So the glucose will move from A to B. Definitely. So let's just look at that first. By the time glucose finishes moving, what will the new numbers on both sides be just for glucose? So these are going to change, right? What will that become? 0 0.75. Very nice. 0 0.75 is the new molarity of glucose if you leave this for an hour and come back and remeasure it, right? And the starch won't move. It's going to stay exactly where it is. So now, after the glucose has finished its moving, what is going to be the movement of the water? Because we it'll know move, it'll move from B to A. Yeah, so the water will go the other way. And the reason is because now if you add up your molarities over here, Make sure I'm doing this right because my math is horrible, guys. See, like nine, five, yes, total. And over here is, oh dear, um, 1.55, is that right? Am I right? I think that's right. Okay, yes. So the final molarity right over here is higher. There's more solutes over here once glucose finishes moving than there is over here, and that will draw the water over from B to A, and therefore this water level should go up a little bit, and this will go down in the end, and you're all finished when it's reached its equilibrium point. Everybody good with that? Yes. That was good. It sounds like you're on top of that, and I didn't make any egregious math um, <laughs> mistakes. There. Okay. All right. I've got another really good example for you about cell membranes. Let's look at, let's just draw a bit of membrane here. Typical phospholipid bilayer, right? And then let's say there's a big channel protein here, and I'm just going to draw it kind of openings at both ends. All right. With more of these here. Okay. All right. This section right here that I'm delineating. Is that section with the with the with the um, the phospholipid tail? Is that hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic. Very good. Okay. So that's hydrophobic. Good for you for remembering that. The top part out here that I'm pointing to are the hydrophilic sections. You guys know that, right? Okay. So what kinds of things can just go right through the phospholipid layer without needing to, to use a channel protein? Oxygen and all the small particles. Yeah, so oxygen can because it's small and nonpolar, right? So small and nonpolar can go through. Oxygen can, carbon dioxide can because it's also small and nonpolar, okay? There's also larger. 
things that can go through as long as they are non polar. So what's the only large organic molecule that you know of that's nonpolar? What group is that? Carbohydrates. No, carbohydrates are polar. Carbohydrates have a charge. Somebody say lipids? If you said lipids, you're right. <laughs> lipids are all nonpolar. So that includes things like steroids. Um, and steroids like um, testosterone, estrogen, cholesterol, they have no problem traveling right through the lipid bilayer. They don't need channels. So that's a good thing for you to know. Okay. The kinds of things, though, that really do need to go through a channel, right? The kinds of things that need a channel in order to go through the membrane would be what kinds of things? Again, polar stuff. Yeah. Polar molecules. Even small things like ions. Right? We learned sodium and potassium, and we know that even as small as they are, because they're charged particles, they really can't make it through the phospholipid um, bilayer without a channel protein or an active transport protein of some sort. Um, so polar molecules, ions, um, water sort of leak through here a little bit, but it's very, very difficult for water to get, get through there with any speed. Water generally needs an aquaporin channel to get through efficiently. Water needs aquaporins, which are protein channels that are just for water. Um, all other things like carbohydrates, carbs, proteins, and nucleic acids generally not traveling through cell membranes very much, but nuclear membranes, yes, RNA needs to get through um, a nuclear membrane and it needs a special channel or pore to do that. Um, but all carbs, proteins, these are polar molecules. They tend to be large. Things like glucose, things like insulin, um, all kinds of things like that. Um, they are either going to need a channel or transport protein, or they're only going to be able to connect on the surface and, um, and send information in remotely. Okay, so that's, that's a good example there. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Where, where is cholesterol located in the cell membrane? Because cholesterol, remember, is part of the cell membrane. It's a stabilizer. Do you remember where it's located? It's a steroid, right? In the bilayer. Yes. Okay. I'm just going to change color here because that's... Yeah. Okay. So um, a cholesterol molecule is usually... Oh, wait. Kind of stuck in there in between the tails like that. So those are, that's my rendition of a cholesterol molecule. I could probably do a little bit better. Um, a steroid cholesterol, it's a multi-chained molecule that kind of has this thing and then it has an antenna out there. That's what a cholesterol molecule looks like. And it situates itself situates itself in those yeah, um, situates itself in there. I'm not going to be able to, to draw that correctly, but trying to connect with what I've drawn down there, but it's a stabilizer of the phospholipids because phospholipids don't have any bi anything bound between them. They're not bound in their positions, just um, orienting their hydrophilic heads out and their hydrophobic tails in. So um, cholesterol is a stabilizer to make sure they don't fly apart when it gets too hot and they don't crystallize when it gets too cold, literally. Okay. I see 35. Yeah. Um, okay. So 
How are you doing with water potential? I'll give you a couple of water potential problems. Would that be a good thing? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, excellent. Good. All right, let's do it. So uh, again, I'm kind of making this up on top of my head here. So let's try. Okay. First of all, let's remember what water potential is. Water potential is really a measure. in bars, right, of the energy of water molecules in any solution. Okay, so total water potential is solute plus pressure. So for example, what if they gave you an example where um, the solute potential was negative seven and the pressure potential was 10? What would the total be? Three bars. Yep, that's it, that's all. So if it's that simple, then, then it's great, but it's usually more complex complex than that. Um, so sometimes, like in our potato lab, right, you didn't have to worry about pressure potential. That dropped out and became zero. But you still had to calculate solute potential. And the, um, the formula for that is negative I C R T. Okay. So now let's say they gave you an example where they said, all right, you have a solution where um, you have a salt solution with 2.6 molar salt at 22 degrees Celsius. Missing something? All right. No, that's it. <laughs> and um, you want to know the solute potential. See if you can calculate that. Remember, R is always the same. R is 0 0.0831. You have to be careful with I because I is the ionization constant, and for salt, what would that be? And temperature is in degrees Kelvin, which is Celsius plus 273. Honestly, I haven't done this problem. <laughs> so um, I'm plugging and chugging right along with you here. Okay, what are you guys getting? I got negative 63.73. You made one error, I think. Negative 126. Uh, yeah, your ionization constant is two when you're dealing with um, an ionic compound that disassociates into two pieces. So you got everything right except that, right? So it's 2 times 2.6 times this times 295, I think. And I got negative 127 is what I got. And it would be bars. Okay? Yeah, careful of that. But... 
That's easily fixed. Once you know what it is, you'll never make that mistake again. So when would the ionization constant be one and not two? It's molecules. When it's a molecule that doesn't dissociate. So any carbohydrate, glucose, sucrose, those don't dissociate. So um, if you're dealing with sucrose or glucose or starch even, um, it's going to be one. The only time it's going to be more than that is if you have an ionic compound that disassociates and ionizes in water. So let me just get rid of this and give you another one. All right. Uh -huh. okay. All right. So now what if you had... Hmm. Make it interesting because I've seen this problem before, something like it. Let's see that you have a cell in water. Okay, and you have here potential is let's say it's negative eight. Okay, like that. And let's say in here, I'm going to give you the information, but not the potential. So I'm going to say it's in an open beaker. So again, you don't have to worry about pressure. Let's say that this is sucrose solution. Um, sucrose and it's oh, 0 .0 0.0.6 6 molar and your Temperature is 21 degrees Celsius. Okay, so first calculate your potential for that. And then tell me which way the water will move once you've done it. I think you have all the information you need. Yeah. It's a very typical question. Could you please explain me again the situation? The situation is you have, let's say, a, a potato cell that's in some water. And all they're telling you about the water is that its water potential is negative 8 bars. So now inside there, you have a sucrose concentration, 0.6 molar, a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, and you need to calculate the, the solute potential of the inside the potato. Once you've done that, um, can you figure out what the water flow would be? So again, the R is still 0.0831. And this time, since I'm doing sucrose, your I value is just one. So what's this? And what's this? And then you calculate that. Right? Your temperature should be, I think, 293, 21 plus 273. 74. Am I getting my arithmetic wrong again? And then your C value is 0. 0.6. So my reasoning is that since there is no pressure, then the total is the bunch of the solute. And I got that is around the negative 14.65. Yeah, that's what I got. I got negative, and you can round up. So I would say negative 15. And then if you have this on the inside, right? Yes. So, right. Yes. Good. So you did that right. So now the next question is, water going to go? Remember, water always moves from higher to lower. So the water will move inside the potato. Yes. And you know this because? Because the potential navigates. 
uh, negative a is like higher than negative 15. Yes. High to low potential. Low, low. Very good. Yes. Because negative 8, I know you need to turn your head outside out to do this, but negative 8 is higher. It's higher water potential out here than it is inside the cell, right? Because negative 8 is closer to 0 than negative 15 is. So the water will flow from where it's higher water potential to where it's lower water potential. Good. If you understand that, that's that's really, really good if you were able to do that along. Okay, <laughs> it's good. getting close. It's 346 now. Um, how are you guys feeling? You feeling a little more confident? Yes. I have one question. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some factors that increase or decrease water potential? Beautiful question. Okay, so solutes, things that you dissolve in the water. What does that do to water potential? The more solutes you add, what happens to the energy of the water molecules? Increase. If you put, so, remember Mr. Anderson's picture of the salt with the water molecules? And he showed how the water molecules kind of bound up around the sodiums and chlorides. Same with sucrose, if you put it in there. Actually, the more solutes you add, the more solutes, the lower the water potential. And that's because solutes to bind the water molecules up and prevent them from moving so that lowers their energy which is really what water potential is it's a measurement of energy so the more solutes you add the more negative the lower the water potential goes the more pressure you have though you get the reverse the more pressure you put on a system whether you have a plant cell that's really, really full of water and there's a lot of pressure in there, that raises the energy of the water molecule so you have higher, the higher the water potential goes. Okay, more solutes, lower water potential. More pressure, higher the water potential. Could you please explain um, what do we need to know about synapses? Neurons, yes, that's a good one. Okay, let me just, I think I can just. Okay, let's go back up here. All right. Neurons. What are we doing that for? Oh, Neurons and synapses. Okay. All right. So let's have, you know, you got one neuron. It's not very good. There's a neuron. Here's a long axon. And here's an axon terminal. And then here is another. Now there's the next neuron. Let's go on. Okay, there we go. This space between the axon terminal of one neuron, right? So the end of one axon and the dendrites or the receiving dendrites of the next neuron right so this would be presynaptic neuron and this would be the post synaptic neuron and the space between them right here is called the synapse. The synapse is just a space, space between the two. Okay, 
So an action potential travels only in one direction, right? An action potential travels down an axon to reach the terminal, and there it needs to hop across the synapse to the receiving dendrite, right? Okay. So now if we blow that up a little bit, let's look at the anatomy of that. Right. So here's the terminal of one, and here is the receiving of the other. Okay, so salty bananas, right? <laughs> so you reverse the salty bananas and your sodiums have flown inside and that's your action potential coming down, right? Because sodiums are going in, in, in. And then that change in the membrane potential causes a couple things to happen. Calcium flows in. And that stimulates these vesicles, which, by the way, are part of the endomembrane system of a neuron. And these vesicles contain chemicals called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, I'm going to make them in red. Okay. So we have neurotransmitters inside a secretory vesicle. Neurotransmitters. Which include things like dopamine that you, read, that you saw in that movie I put for you, and GABA, and serotonin, and lots of other things that are messengers, chemical messengers that, that go between the space of the synapse. So there's a secretory vesicle there. And that secretory vesicle gets stimulated by the action potential and a flow of calcium ions to move towards the edge of that synapse and release the neurotransmitters, secrete them into that space. On the other side, the postsynaptic is still the postsynaptic, presynaptic, postsynaptic. You have receptors, receptors that are exactly made to fit the shape of these neurotransmitters, whatever they may be. And when those neurotransmitters fit into the receptor, the receptor is a, a channel that is stimulated to open, not with ATP, but by the neurotransmitter fitting into it. And usually what happens is they will open and allow the flow of sodium to continue. Right? So the neurotransmitter causes them to open. And for the action potential to then continue. OK? That's it. That's what happens at the synapse. And that actually connects with the endomembrane system that we talked about today. Remember, a neuron is just a cell. Just like any cell, it has a nucleus, it has a ER, it has a Golgi body that's packaging proteins such as neurotransmitters into secretory vesicles that are hanging out here waiting for calcium ions to come along and say, hey, go secrete those neurotransmitters. We've got a nerve impulse happening here. So literally, that's what's going on. And it just depends on what kind of nerve cell it is and, and what it's um, what kind of signals it's sending, what part of the brain it's in, which neurotransmitter is being is being made and packaged and, and then sending the signal on. There. That's the most complete talk I've given of that. Um, all right. Does that feel better? Yes, thank you. Yeah, excellent. That was a really good question. OK. Um, all right, and the actual action potential graph, I think you had a lot of exposure to that. Do you feel pretty confident with that? If you were to graph like you were in the mastery quiz and you had to interpret the different parts of it? 
Oh, you mean like uh, the polarization and... Yeah, I do. What, oops, what did I do? Oh, no, no, no. Um, okay. Oh, oh, no, I didn't. Okay, didn't mean to do that. <sighs> Here we go. All right. So let's just go back to this. All right. So you remember that there was a graph. Let me try to draw straight lines here, right? And then you had you had millivolts, yes. And then you had time down here. And let's say here is negative seventy, and here is negative uh, fifty-five, and up here is plus thirty. So you did that graph, right? Where if the millivolts of the cell are right at negative 70, what, what type of potential is that? If it's right there at negative 70. Salty bananas, right? Which potential is that? Is that action or resting? At negative 70? It's resting. And resting potential is a misnomer because resting potential takes a tremendous amount of energy to maintain, right? So if you're actually looking at the cell membrane then, um, it's there are sodium potassium pumps which are pumping in more sodium than they are pumping out potassium. And that takes ATP to do that. So to make it more positive in here, right? I'm doing that wrong. I don't know there's salty bananas, right? No, salty bananas is the other way. Resting potential is ah. Sorry, the way around. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm so tired. Um, let me. It does take ATP, but it's doing the opposite thing. Let me just fix that. Okay, so it's it's bringing in potassium and pushing. So that makes it more positive out here at rest than it is in here, right? Because it's pushing three out and two in. And that takes energy. So it actually takes energy. It's like pulling back on a spring to maintain resting potential. And then what happens to reverse that is that the sodium channels are opened if they're stimulated enough. So if you... If you start to get more positive, it's because sodium is flowing in. And as long as it hits the threshold of negative 55, it'll keep going all the way up until it reaches positive 30. And this is action potential. And with action potential, now you've reversed it so that the pluses are on the inside and the negatives are on the outside because now the sodiums are flowing in. Sodium flows in, but it flows in on its gradient, a gradient that was set up by the sodium potassium part, right? Then once it hits a certain, then the potassium gates flow open, right? And the potassium flows back, goes out, which reverses it back and it goes actually hyperpolarizes. And then it goes back to resting, right? Um, so back to resting. So this is depolarization, where it reverses, and this is repolarization. Both of those processes are actually sort of passive. It's going through channel gates down their, um, down their gradients, which seems wrong because if that's the action potential, that's actual nerve impulse flowing down your nerve. But it was set up by, by ATP pumps that pushed more, more sodiums out than they put, pushed potassiums in. And then that set it up so that when somebody pulled on the spring, sodium flowed down, potassium flowed down, and then um, you know, you had a bump. And then hyperpolarization here. 
which is really just to prevent the impulse from going backwards, I think. So put this little thing here. And, and then the pumps are what set it back to right then. Okay. I think, um, I mean, if you go back to the Ed puzzle with Mr. Mr. Anderson, he could probably explain it better um, than my little scribbles here. But this is correct. So um, I'm sorry, I'm at the end of my rope here, guys. <laughs> um, I do encourage you to uh, to try the um, progress check on AP Classroom and put some more cahoots up for you. So that will help. That progress check has some seriously um, depth questions on it. So that should give you an idea of just how um, how much application you're going to be facing on this test. And so they'll, they're going to be asking you about things that you know, but you're going to have to, you know, okay, here's a here's a graph in a situation. What do you remember about the mitochondria to help you answer it? Here's a graph in a situation. What do you remember about transmembrane proteins to help you answer it? That sort of thing. So you need to know your stuff, um, but then you're going to have to apply it to get your questions right. I hope it was helpful. I really do. I'm going to take the recording and post it so you can look at it again if you And uh, yes, no problem. Have a wonderful weekend. It was lovely to see all of you. And, uh, you know, give me an email if you're, but you really should try to relax. Okay, get some good stuff and some food. Peace. I'm glad you were here. Yes, Ayan, yes. Hi, I just had a quick question. Um, so on AP Classroom, I noticed that the progress check was 30 questions and only 60 minutes. 